Let me quickly tell you why I think there are some challenges in teaching or preaching numbers. I hope you can see I, I get quite excited about it. Um, it's some years since I studied numbers and preached it. I preached it a couple of times, um, but it's five years probably since I last preached it. I'm still excited about it, though, and I hope you can see that. Um, but there are some challenges, and it's good when you go into a preaching or teaching series to be honest about the challenges that there are. Um, otherwise, you get, um, with, especially with a book that's 36 chapters long, you get a little kind of bit laid down in it. So um, here are some of the cha challenges, I think. First of all, it's an unfamiliar book. It's an unfamiliar book. Um, not only to those... Um, who are listening, but those of us who are preaching as well. We probably don't know it as well as we know other books of the Bible. Um, I'm sure you don't know Numbers as well as you know Exodus, for example. Um, so there are challenges with a book that's unfamiliar. I think also that that gives you an opportunity, because very often um, it's teaching... We're, we're very often teaching the same old lessons, aren't we? But actually they come with a freshness in Numbers, simply because the stories aren't so well known. So although people will know the stories about the spies... They probably remember that from Sunday school. They might not know the stories about um, Korah and his rebellions, for example. They might know the story about the talking donkey, but they don't really know what it's teaching. And so all the, uh, because there's this freshness about it, because there's an unfamiliarity about it, um, I think actually it's a great book to uh, preach or teach in church. And some people think it's very irrelevant. That's the second challenge, I think. I hope you've seen this morning, even, even if we've gone through, that actually it's not the case. But to many people, it's a kind of a distant people, a distant land, a very kind of odd setting, you know, on the march. It's kind of a bit like a sort of a caravan holiday, but without the caravan. I mean, it's a kind of, it's, there's nothing very, you know, uh, very familiar about it in that sense. Very sort of, um, you know, this is me. You can't, you can't read yourself into it straight away. And again, I think sometimes that's a, that's a help because it means that as a, as a preacher or a teacher, you have to work hard at application and actually, I find that, I don't know if you find this, but I find the harder I work at the application, the more sort of focused and gripping it becomes. You have to really wrestle with it to see what it means. Um, and actually, the people who are listening appreciate that. Um, genre, I think, is one of the hardest things about the book, and um, most of the commentaries don't talk about this at all. Uh, the book is a real mix. So this is the challenge of it. There is prophecy in the book of Numbers. There is poetry in the book of Numbers. There is narrative in the book of Numbers. There is law in the book of Numbers. Have we covered just about every genre? Pretty much. Okay. There is a bit of everything, and it's all mixed up. Now, that makes, that makes it exciting as a book to read. It's not just sort of great big long stories. The, the, the pace is kind of, it's, it kind of goes fast and then slow and then fast and slow. And the, you know, there's, a, there's a movement to it. But actually, it makes it a challenge to preach. Because if you're preaching a series on Isaiah, let's say, you get people, don't you, who are listening. And, and uh, you know, you have visitors every week, I hope, but, but generally people, you know, are regulars. They get used to certain kind of, a uh, certain kind of genre. You get used to preparing a certain way. And so there's a rhythm about doing a series in, say, a book like Isaiah or doing a series in a, a book like Genesis. There's a rhythm to it where you're getting into Old Testament narrative or you're getting into prophecy. You're thinking about the way it works in your mind. You're thinking about how best to communicate this. And with a book of Numbers, you don't really have that luxury. Because just when you've got used to doing a little bit of Old Testament narrative, along comes a bit of law, and you need a slightly different approach. And then you finish a bit of law, and along comes a bit of poetry. You think, okay, we've got a slightly different approach again. So it does keep you on your toes, and, and perhaps not so much for the hearers, but for those who are teaching, that does make it a challenge. It does make it a challenge. And, um, and I say to people who are, are going to embark on a series of numbers, start your preparation early. I think, it's, I think it's worth reading it through. I always think this anyway, but I think it's worth reading it through and reading it for yourself first, a couple of times maybe even, so you've got a feel of how the book is working and how the different genres kind of interact together. Um, another challenge is the length. It's a reasonably long book, 36 chapters. Okay, well, if you did a chapter a week, that might be more than your people could stomach, um, 36 chapters of numbers. Um, so it is a long book, but, but actually the challenge is not so much about the length of the book, as the length of sections. So even though it's got 36 chapters, some of the sections that fit together are themselves very long. It doesn't have 36 sections. It has less sections than that. Um, I've preached it twice, I say, I think I've preached it in 16. That's the kind of length. I think you could preach it slightly quicker than that. Um, so, for example, 7 and 8. Have a look at 7 and 8 with me. So we had a quick look at seven, didn't we? And I said that was the chapter that was abbreviated. Well, seven in my bubble, bu bu bubble, my Bible covers almost four pages. There's a lot of detail there. And um, chapter eight, I think, belongs with it. 
because it's all about how the tabernacle is constructed and, and operates. Or if you like, chapter 1 to 4 really kind of in a way fit together. So the challenge with numbers is not so much the book is long, it's actually that the sections that I think you'd want to preach together to give it some coherence are long. And what do you do with that? What do you do with chapter 7? What do you do with that in church? Do you just get somebody to read out the first few verses and then you say, and the rest is kind of the same sort of thing? Well, actually, you're doing exactly what my abbreviated Bible did on you. You do that. Um, we, um, last time I preached on number seven, a couple of years ago, just on this one chapter, I got 12 people to do the readings. I did the first bit and the last bit, and then I got one person to come and read for each tribe. I tried to get them to read reasonably quickly to get some pace. It took about 12 minutes to read it. Um, but it, was, it worked really well. It was exciting to have the whole of it read. That's what's meant to happen. And um, I'm a great believer in not abbreviating readings. You can pick that up later, perhaps, if you want to. So it, it, they are, the sections are long, but they are manageable. Let me encourage you. They are manageable. Um, and I think it is worth um, pursuing that. Uh, by the way, there are lots of names. And names sometimes um, make people who are reading feel a little bit uncertain, don't they? I always say to people, if you're reading, especially Old Testament names, just be confident. That's what we're looking for, just be confident. Um, no one really knows how they're pronounced. And a lady in the first church, when we were married, my wife and I, the first church we were in, the lady who used to do the reading sometimes, if there was a word that she um, didn't know how to um, pronounce, she would just say Hun Stanton, which was bizarre because, um, you know, in a <laughs> Numbers chapter one. <laughs> I don't know why I told you that. Um, obscurity. Some of the sections do seem somewhat obscure, especially the law sections. So they do seem somewhat obscure. Why do you get a little bit, for example, about silver trumpets in chapter 10? You know, what's the significance of the silver trumpets there? It all seems a bit obscure. Do we really need to know about the silver trumpets? Well, when you get to chapter 10, you discover, yes, you do need to know about the silver trumpets. Because the silver trumpets are, are, are not just functional, in chapter 10, they're not just about, this is how you call all the people together, which is what they are for, but they're also uh, about what will happen when you're in the promised land. So, for example, in chapter 10, verse 8, the sons of Aaron, the priests, are to blow the trumpets. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you and the generations to come. When you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets, then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. Also, at your times of rejoicing, your appointed festivals and new moon feasts, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before, the Lord, before your God. I am the Lord your God. In other words, um, God is thinking about the promised land, even if the people aren't thinking about the promised land. God is thinking about what life is going to be like. And when you're in the promised land, boys and girls, that's what he's saying to them, and you hear the sound of that trumpet, you will remember what has happened before. It's a bit like putting the Ebenezer in the, you know, in, in the river. This is the, this is the stone. This is, this is the reminder that this is what the Lord has been doing for you. So actually, even then, when the silver trumpets seem to be a, a bit obscure, they serve a really important purpose. Um, the last challenge I just want to highlight for you, I think, is the one that I just um, touched on before in chapter 31, which is the one of violence. Violence isn't really the right word. Holy war. And especially in chapter 31, the total destruction. But it's not just chapter 31. When the rebellions are put down, God's judgment is complete. You know, when Korah and the sons of Korah rebel, the whole clan is wiped out. No one is spared. Now, um, we haven't really got time to talk about holy war in any great detail. Um, let me just point you towards one useful resource I found very helpful. Have you ever seen those books? They're produced by Zondervan. Five views on this, three views on that, four views on that. Have you seen those with different people kind of putting their view and then someone responding? There is one of those on holy war. It's called, I can't remember how many views it is now, it's terrible. It's called something like Five Views on the Canaanite Genocide. But if you type into Google Canaanite Genocide, you will get the title of the book. The last chapter is written by Tremper Longman III. Tremper Longman III. Junior, or whatever it's called. Anyway, a great, great little chapter on holy war and what exactly is going on. I found that really helpful. Um, and just what it is, um, is happening with holy law. It's about God's judgment. It's about God's holiness. And rather than kind of raise questions about how, how brutal it all seems to be, actually it should raise issues in our mind about how holy God is and how this holy God that we worship, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, 
cannot bear even to look upon sin in any form. And there's something going on there, um, which I think is a great help. Those, those are some of the challenges. Um, not on your notes, but I think will be helpful. Let me just give you one or two um, little tips for preaching it before we look at one or two passages in a bit more detail and see how they might work. Think about it Christologically. Um, so one or two tips. Um, try and take some of the sections together. Don't break up the sections too much. There are some purple bits, purple passages. There are verses that you will recognise. Numbers 32, for example, contains the very famous verse, be sure your sin will find you out, which when I was a teenager, my uh, now mother-in-law used to say to me all the time, I don't know why, she obviously was a bit suspicious about me as a teenager. Um, and it's very tempting just to take that verse and run with it. But of course it has a context, and in Numbers 32 it's a very important context about disunity. It's not just about sin, it's about a particular sin, which is the sin of disunity and breaking apart God's people. So try and take units together. Um, number two, I've already uh, alluded to this, don't be afraid of lengthy passages. And don't be afraid of repetition. We do believe, we have a doctrine of Scripture that we believe in, don't we? All Scripture is useful. All Scripture. And so when something is presented in a certain way, God is presenting it in a certain way for a reason. And we'll have a look about, at that with chapter 7 in just a moment. Uh, bear in mind where you are in the book. Are you in the first generation or the second generation? That's always important to remember. Um, look for clear descriptions of God's character. So in, even in the law sections, God reveals who he is all the time. God is speaking, God is revealing. Um, next tip, don't be afraid of examples. Now, I've got to be a little bit careful here because I'm against moralising from the Old Testament, but I'm in favour of using the Old Testament as examples. And uh, in order to do that, let me just break off from that list and show you uh, number four on your little sheet there, um, preaching Christ from numbers. So how are we to preach Christ from numbers? Well, in some places, Christ is mentioned specifically, um, by which I mean there are direct allusions to Christ Jesus. There are 145, according to Greg Beale, there are 145 allusions to Christ in the book of Numbers. And not always specific references, but illusions. Some of those um, are connections which are very obvious, so let's have a look at one or two of those. Numbers 21 is one of them. So Numbers 21 verse 8, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. That of course becomes uh, John 3.15, isn't it? It's picked up in John 3, as um, the, the, we should be looking to Christ and living. So there are kind of connections like that. Um, sometimes the connections aren't so obvious in that they're not necessarily picked up by the New Testament, but clearly you know something is going on. So have a look at the um, Numbers, where should we go? Let's have a look at Numbers 24. So Numbers 24, and let's look at Balaam's fourth oracle. Verse 17, do you see that? I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will go strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. It's a glorious prophecy, ultimately fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So I haven't got a New Testament quote that proves that's Christ Jesus, but he is, he is the morning star, isn't he? He is the star of Jacob. So you get to passages like that, you know exactly who that's speaking about. So there are allusions, uh, both direct and indirect. There are, if you like, um, types. I think Moses is picked up in the book of Numbers as a type. But there are um, one or two places where the book of Numbers is referred to more specifically. Let's have a look at those. So let's turn to Psalm 95. Let's leave numbers behind for a moment. And Psalm 95 and Psalm 106 are two psalms that are pretty important in understanding the Old Testament. You'll forgive me for not reading it all, but in the interest of time, that's probably the best. Um, so let's go to verse 7, halfway through verse 7 of Psalm 95. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me. 
Now, that could refer to the testing that happened in Exodus. But let's read on. Where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And because of the 40-year reference, which is, of course, the punishment in the wilderness, I think Psalm 95 is primarily referring to the, the water incidents that happen in the book of Numbers. So what is the key lesson? What is the application from Psalm 95? What is the application going back to Numbers? What's the ex exhortation in Psalm 95? Don't harden your hearts. In other words, don't be like them. Don't make the same mistake they made. And we're going to see in just a moment that gets picked up again, of course, in Hebrews. Let's turn across to Psalm 106. Psalm 106 is a great psalm, really describing the exodus and the history, really condensed history of the people of God. I've lost my page over here. Psalm 106. I'll find it soon. Um, let's just have a quick scan down. You'll see that it begins with some of the, the incidents in Exodus. Verse 7, when our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses. And they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. That's referring to the first rebellion. Yet he saved them. And then you learn about some of the things that happened. So verse 13, they soon forgot what he had done, did not wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wilderness, they put God to the test. So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease among them. Numbers 11. That's Numbers 11. In the camp, they grew envious of Moses and of Aaron, who was consecrated to the Lord. The earth opened up and swallowed Dathan. It buried the companies of Abiram. Fire blazed among their followers. That's number 16. And as you read through, you see other um, instances as well. You, verse 28, do you see that? Recognize the language? They yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Well, we know now where that is. That's Numbers 25. Okay? Now, what is the application from Psalm 106? Well, interestingly, there are two applications from Psalm 106. Number one is verse 1 and verse 48, praise the Lord. It's praise the Lord. What is the second application? Verse 47, save us, Lord our God, and gather us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. So what is the application, according to Psalm 106 of the book of Numbers? It is, let's praise the Lord that he kept going with us. He didn't give up on us. And Lord, save us from this. Don't let us get like them. Preserve us. Keep us. That we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Isn't that significant? So we're getting applications, really, for the whole of the book of Numbers. We're understanding how the book of Numbers really should work. Um, you may know, by the way, that the book of Psalms is divided into five books. Um, and some commentators think the five books of Psalms kind of have some connection with the five books of the Torah, the, the first five books of the Bible. And if that's the case, Psalm 106 is the last psalm of book four, and it corresponds to numbers. So what's going on in Psalm 106? It's basically drawing examples from the book of Numbers, which is exactly what Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's have a look at that. So just in case you're thinking, well, this is all Old Testament stuff, let me show you what Paul thinks about it. And Paul is not afraid to spiritualize numbers. One of the things that perhaps we're a little bit nervous about today is getting too spiritual, a bit too pietistic. But actually, Paul is not afraid to appropriately spiritualize numbers. Listen to what he says. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, this is verse 1, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses. Is that the way you describe the Red Sea? They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Listen, that rock was Christ. So who was with these Israelites in the wilderness? Christ was with them. That's what Paul is saying. Spiritually, that's what was going on. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with them, with most of them, it's an understatement. God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. It's described in Numbers. Now, these things occurred as examples 
to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie. Well, that's a quote from Exodus 32, Golden Calf. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. That's Numbers 25. That's the number who died in Numbers 25. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Numbers 21. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel, almost certainly Numbers 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So how does Paul see the book of Numbers? He sees it as an example. Actually, for the most part, as a negative example. That's why dividing the book into two is so helpful, because that first bit stands as a negative example. Don't do that. Don't be idolaters. Don't indulge in sexual immorality. Don't put God to the test. And I think that's a control for your application when you get to Numbers. So in Numbers chapter 11, where you have the people grumbling and grumbling and grumbling, what's the application? Do not grumble, as some of them did. That's got to be your key application. Now, in case you think, well, that doesn't sound very Christian, it sounds a bit worksy, it sort of sounds a bit old covenant, let's read on in 1 Corinthians 10. This is quite helpful, isn't it? Verse 12, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So, so how does do not grumble stop from being kind of worksy sermon? just beating people up. It's always easy to beat people up, isn't it? I was once told when I was just learning to preach 25 years ago, it's much easier to beat people up than it is to build them up. And that's true. And you could use Numbers 11 to beat people up. So how is that going to become a, a Christian sermon? Well, there's conviction, do not grumble, but there is encouragement. God always provides a way out. It doesn't allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And in fact, the rock that was travelling with them was Christ. And of course, how do you not grumble? You look to Christ. You find your contentment in Christ. You see how suddenly um, we're beginning to see how Christian messages come out of what appears to be a very old covenanty book. No, it's a Christian book. It's, a, it's in the Christian scripture. That's 1 Corinthians 10. Let's look at one more place. Let's go to Hebrews. Now, let me tell you about Hebrews. Um, I think it's one of the most neglected books of the Old Testament, of the New Testament. Um, we, we go to Romans, don't we, for our systematic theology, and that's right. We ought to go to Hebrews for our biblical theology. And um, you know, churches often say, I've heard Tim Keller say, for example, oh, yeah, I preach Romans very regularly in church, but you need to preach Hebrews, brothers, in church as well, because it really unlocks the Old Testament. Um, in fact, it really unlocks the book of Numbers. My um, uh, colleague, he was a colleague, he's just gone to, to Ottawa to pastor a church, Jonathan Griffiths. And did his doctorate on Hebrews. He's got a much bigger brain than I've got. And he says, as you go through Hebrews, for chapter by chapter, it's almost as though the author has numbers open in front of him because he seems to be kind of mirroring the stories and the pattern in numbers. Not quite, but almost. The same tone, the same stories, the same links with the priests and everything else. It's almost as though the two are, are, are running in parallel. And Hebrews is a great help and of course, it's not just a great help, it does actually refer to numbers. And it refers to numbers, especially in chapters 3 and 4. And it refers to numbers by talking about Psalm 95. So this is amazing, isn't it? In Hebrews 3 and 4, you get an inspired, spirit-inspired Bible study on Psalm 95. And the spirit-inspired Bible study is to draw the lesson... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. It keeps getting repeated. So it's repeated when it's first quoted. There it is in, um, where are we? Um, and verse 8. It appears again in verse 15, and it appears again down in verse 7. Do not harden your hearts. And, and of course, we haven't got time to look at Hebrews. We're not here to look at Hebrews, but you'll know that um, the way the writer of the Hebrews understands the Sabbath rest, the land, is not actually a physical piece of land, but the promised land, the heavenly country that's being looked forward to. And he says even Joshua didn't give that to them. They didn't. Um, they hadn't entered his rest even after Joshua gave them the promised land. And so what the writer of the Hebrews is saying, that Old Testament theme of the land, that's all about 
the new heavens and the new earth. It's all about the promised land that you're heading towards. That's the way you should be understanding it. And that actually is the way we should be understanding numbers. That when they're going towards the land, when they're laying hold of the land, when they're pursuing the land, they are spiritually pursuing the, the great thing that God has promised us, the new heavens and the new earth in Christ Jesus. So um, we're not into moralizing. We're not into, into just drawing moral lessons. We're saying that, no, Christ was with them as they traveled. But actually, the, the lessons that they learned about the promised land are very relevant to Christians today, very relevant. Now, some people ask, well, how do you keep those two things together? And here's the answer. I heard this from um, Ed Clowney. Ed Clowney um, uh, was um, in Philadelphia and wrote a very helpful book, which was published in the 60s, called Preaching and Biblical Theology, which I think may be out of print, but you can probably get second-hand copies of it. And, and one of the things that Ed Clowney said is that the, there are these two tensions when you preach the Old Testament. One is you want to preach Christ. So that's Paul's motive, isn't it? Colossians 1.28, him we proclaim. I want to be a preacher of Christ. He said the other tension is you've got these examples in the Old Testament. And Paul, for example, and the, the writer to the Hebrews, is holding up these Old Testament characters as, as examples for us. How do you hold these two things in tension? Well, on the one hand, I want to preach Christ. and On the other hand, I want to give people examples to follow. And of course, what you discover in church life is that people tend to go towards one or the other. So you make too much of the examples, you end up with Christ-less preaching, which just gives people moralism, just gives people works. But if you just preach Christ, and you only talk about Christ, you don't talk about the moral lessons that come out of the Old Testament, you've really only got one thing to say about the Old Testament, and, and actually you're robbing it of its detail and colour that the Spirit has inspired. So this is what Ed Clowney said. He said, this is how you keep them together. He said, what you remember is that the Old Testament is the book of the Lamb. It's the book about Jesus. And how do you follow those Old Testament examples? How do you listen to the convictions that they give you? How do you say to yourself, I'm not going to be like this, I am going to be different, only by following the Lamb, only by keeping your eyes fixed on him. And it's in Christ that these two things come together. So can you preach an example from Numbers? You can if you preach it as part of the book of the Lamb. And you, you offer people forgiveness in Christ and also in his spirit, power to fight temptation and be different. That's how these two things come together. And I think that, apart from a few passages, that's primarily the way that Numbers works. I'm a little bit ahead of myself because I've already done the first bit there on the notes, reading repetitive passages in church. I've already given you an idea of how you might do that. It is worth doing. I always worry, by the way, brothers, that when we in church abbreviate passages, you know, when we've got a, you know, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and we read the first few verses and then we read the last few verses, I always worry, what are we teaching our guys who are listening about Scripture? I think we're teaching them that actually what I say is more important than what Scripture says. That might be one thing we're teaching them. We're teaching them that they can be selective about Scripture. So I want to encourage you not to do that. I, I, I really don't like it, but enough of my pet hates. Um, so here's a possible sermon, um, and I've, I've, you'll appreciate here that I've, I've missed out all my workings. I'm just giving you my headings to show you how it can work as a, as a sermon. Okay? So what I think you get in number seven is you get all the tribes coming together, and you get them coming together, and you get them worshipping at the dedication of the tabernacle, and you learn something about what it means to worship the living God. Now, I was preaching that, I would be a bit more precise because I would want to say, I think probably at the outset of the sermon, and the living God reveals himself supremely in his son. So what are we learning about worshipping the living God? We're, wor we're learning about what it means to worship Christ Jesus. And that would be the way that I would kind of introduce the, um, it wouldn't be the introduction, but that would be a way I would get the sort of the Christological bit done in a sermon. And what you discover as you go through is you discover there's some principles going on in Numbers 7. In fact, you discover there are quite a lot, um, but here are just three. The first thing you discover is that um, worship is corporate. And you'll see that I, I made this a bit more specific. I said Christian worship is corporate. So when the tabernacle is set up, notice that the tribes come together to bring their offerings. Now, I know that in the law, there are lots of laws that are given so that individuals can come and bring an offering if they've sinned, individuals can come and give a grain offering, and so on and so forth. But what is the overwhelming tone of number seven 
is that people come together. In fact, their worship unites them. They are gathered together to come and make their offerings at the tabernacle. And that's very clear, um, not simply in the way that each tribe comes, and the leader of the tribe comes in each case, but actually the way that each of the tribes is, is described in exactly the same way. There is a, a sort of a flattening, if you like. The tribes, by the way, are different sizes. You discover that back in chapter 1. You discover that the tribes go from the smallest tribe is Manasseh, which has 32,000 men in it, and the largest tribe is, um, if I can remember, Dan, is that right? Oh, no, sorry, the largest tribe is Judah, 75,000. So the largest tribe is twice the size of the smallest tribe. And yet when they bring their offerings, everyone is equal before God. All the tribes bring exactly the same thing, and they come together. There is a, a corporate gathering that is going on here. And it's very significant, isn't it? It happens time and time again in the Bible that when God's people are gathered together, they come together to worship. I think that's very key in the way that it's described. And I think that's the why you get the repetition. The point that the author and the narrator is trying to make is all the tribes were there. They were all giving the same. So that was my first point. And in that, I talked a little bit about unity and I talked about how the, the kind of the... Um, coming before God sort of leveled the playing field. There weren't some who were more important than others and all, all the rest of it. The second thing you see very clearly is that offering um, that they make, the offerings they make. So Christian worship is sacrificial. So what do they do when they come to God? The first thing they do is they have to offer sacrifices. And those are detailed in quite a lot of detail. So you'll see there that there's a um, burnt offering, there's a sin offering, there's a fellowship offering. But there's an understanding within the worship of, the gods, of God's people that they can't simply come as they are. They have to come with sacrifices. They have to come and give an offer, offering. It, it, it's not simply that they're making sacrifices. You know, they're not just digging their hands in their pockets. They're realising that there is this gulf between them that has to be bridged. And that's true, isn't it, of all worship, that we have to realise that we're coming to a God who is holy, and the only way we can come to him is to approach him through his Son. And, and therefore, there is something about the centrality of Christ in worship and his sacrifice. There is something about the significance of the Lord's Supper and remembering the sacrifice. But even when you don't have the Lord's Supper, there is something significant about remembering that we come to the Father through the Son in the power of the Spirit. And then right towards the end, there's a very interesting part in number seven, which is when the people come together, look at what happens. So you get a summary in verse 84 of everything happened. And then in verse 89, Moses finally enters the tent. And just listen to the words of verse 89. When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant Law. In this way, the Lord spoke to him. What is the goal of all this worship? What is the goal? It's for Moses to go in and what? To hear the voice of the Lord, isn't it? In fact, it's almost repetitious. Moses entered the tent. In fact, the tent here is not called the tabernacle. It's given its other name, just to make the point. The tent of meeting. To speak with the Lord, he heard the voice. It's repeated at the end. In this way, the Lord spoke to him. In other words, Moses comes into the tent to have an encounter with the living God in which he speaks and the living God speaks to him. But the focus actually predominantly is on the living God speaking to him. Chapter 8, verse 1, And the Lord said... So there is something about worship which is not simply offering sacrifices to God, although our praise is a, a sacrifice to him, sacrifice of praise, language from Hebrews. But actually it's about being attentive to what he says to us. We worship God by, by coming into his presence, and we can only do that together, or we do it best together, and with the sacrifice of Christ, but we do it to be attentive to his voice. And suddenly what seems quite an unpromising chapter, just lists of names and numbers, comes a little bit alive. That actually there's, there's a prototype going on here that's saying this is the way that we worship. And, and suddenly it, the, the applications, are, are, well, they're enormous. All kinds of things you could be saying about our worship today and what it means to worship God together. Um, for example, I think when I preached this in the church where I was a pastor, I was very conscious that when we celebrate, we did it, we, I preached this passage on a week when we had the Lord's Supper. And one of the things I'm very conscious of in church is that the Lord's Supper can easily become very private. It's just me and Jesus. 
I, I even close my eyes, or I'm an Anglican, I go up on, you know, in a little file. But um, you know, free churchmen are, are not exempt from this, because we just close our eyes to shut everybody else out. It's supposed to be a fellowship meal, isn't it? It's supposed to be a meal that you have together. That's the significance of it. You don't have it at home on your own, you have it together. And what's going on here? Well, it's informing what you would do, actually, in a Lord's Supper service. So the applications can be really quite rich and, and quite deep from what appears to be, as I said, a very unpromising passage. So that's how I think I would preach a, a passage like number seven. Um, let's go over to numbers 22 and have a look at that. And then I will stop for questions after that. Numbers 22, by the way, is, is one of the funniest parts of the Bible. Um, the Lord does use humour to make a point, and the talking donkey is one of those little instances. Um, I'm, um, you, you may have heard the story. If you've ever read Lloyd-Jones' book on preaching, um, he tells of a sermon um, that he once heard preached on Numbers 22, verse 21. Have you heard this story? Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. And Lloyd-Jones heard someone preach a sermon, and the first point of the sermon was a, bad, uh, a good trait in a bad man. Because although Balaam was a bad man, he got up early. So that was the first point. Okay? Second point, um, uh, the antiquity of saddlery. Because he saddled his donkey. Did you know that saddles were that old? I think that was the point that the preacher was making. That was the second point. And the third point, and I kid you not, the third point of the sermon was a few thoughts about the woman at the well. Which had nothing to do with the passage whatsoever, but he'd kind of run out of things to say. And um, Lloyd-Jones says in his book, um, he uses it as an illustration to say two things. The points you make must come from the text and must flow one from the other. I think it's a great little help. Now, what do you do then when you come to Numbers? How do you preach the story of um, Balaam and his ass? Well, let's just have a little read, shall we, and um, see what goes on. So, verse 1. Then the Israelites travelled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now, Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And by the way, this comes straight after Israel has just won a good battle. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to Sulla, summoned Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the river Euphrates in his native land. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. And by, by the way, some people want to make um, Balaam a bit of a hero. They just say, well, he was just a good guy who did a few things wrong. But clearly he's up for sale, isn't he? Balaam is not a good guy. And later on you learn that he's the one who... Um, tells the Moabites, if you really want to get the Israelites, just send your good-looking women in, chapter 25. All that nonsense in chapter 25, Balaam is behind that. And you discover that later in the book of Numbers. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you an answer and give you the answer the Lord gives me. It all sounds very spiritual. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. God, notice that um, when God comes to Balaam, he doesn't use a divine name. That's a little clue. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. That verse is the key to the whole of 22, 23, and 24. God repeats it several times. Okay? They are blessed. They cannot be cursed. This is the great encouragement, by the way, from the enemy camp. If God is for you, who can be against you? That's what's going on. It's basically the end of Romans 8, but worked out in a, in a narrative. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other officials, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippel, says, do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. In other words, name your price. 
Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, Even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Sounds very spiritual. Now spend the night here so I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. Isn't that odd, verse 19? Why doesn't it end at verse 18? See what else the Lord will tell me. In other words, what's Balaam saying? I'll ask again. Perhaps he might change his mind. He, we know he likes money. That's the way that Balaam is explained, isn't it, in um, 2 Peter. He's the one who loves money. That night, God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. I'm just kind of commenting as I go. I hope that's all right. And by the way, this is a difficult verse. How come, if God doesn't want him to go, he now lets him go? Any theories on that? Romans 1 help at all? What's going on? I think this is God giving Balaam up, isn't it? Balaam is after the money. Okay? And what is happening when God suddenly appears to change his mind? No, he's not changing his mind. He's giving Balaam up to what he really wants. And Balaam, by the way, will get killed later. Not in 22 to 24, but he, he does get his comeuppance in Numbers 31. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. Okay, so we know what the sermon would be on that verse. But God was very angry when he went... Again, that's slightly odd. How is God angry with him if he's told him to go? The answer is because this is his settled anger. This is his wrath. He's giving him up to judgment, and that is part of his anger. God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord... Oh, by the way, if you've got an ESV, verse 22, is not translated so well. Has anybody got an ESV? What does it say, verse 22? Okay. It is possible to translate the verse that way. God's anger was kindled because he went. But that little word key in Hebrew could also mean as he went. So God's anger was kindled, kindled as he went, which would fit much more with the, the story. So the history is not particularly helpful there in that, just that one verse. Um, so God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now, the, the story now revolves around sets of threes. Three things happen, three times, and well, you'll see how the story develops. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it, so he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Do you see the irony? The donkey is saving his life. And what's he doing? He's just beating the donkey. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what, I have done, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you here and now. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell down. The angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared it. Do you, do you see what's going on? The donkey, which by the way is not a clever animal in the Bible, and this, um, I'm glad you're all men because I can say this, um, you just have to take this as it is, but donkeys are normally male in the Bible. This donkey is female. Just to, I think, kind of make the point, just to highlight how stupid Balaam is. Okay? Take that as you want. Um, so this female donkey saves Balaam three times. The female donkey sees what Balaam cannot. Okay? And what does the donkey see? The donkey sees the angel of the Lord. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the Moabite town on the Arnhem border at the edge of his territory. Balak said to Balaam, did I not send you an urgent summons? Why didn't you come to me? Am I really not able to reward you? Well, I have come to you now, Balaam replied, but I can't say whatever I please. I must speak only what God puts in my mouth. Then Balaam went with Balak to 
Um, Kiriath Huzoth, Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep and gave some to Balaam and the officials who were with him. The next morning, Balak took Balaam up to Bamoth Baal, and from there he could see the outskirts of the Israelite camp. And you may know how it goes. There are um, seven different oracles, and each time it kind of escalates, each time um, Balaam is not able to curse the Israelites. I, I, I'm assuming, I take it, he really wants to. He wants the money. That's why he's there. He's being given up to judgment, but God is intervening. And his blessed people cannot be cursed. It's a great story. Um, it takes a while to read and takes a while to explain. But the message of it is very simple and yet very powerful. And it's powerful because the narrative builds attention. And the power of the message is, whatever you try and do to God's people, you cannot curse them if they are blessed by God. Whatever you try and do. You can send anything against them. You can take, as Luther said, you can take our goods, our wives, our husbands, our children, our lives, how does the thing go, something like that, doesn't it? Um, ours is the everlasting kingdom. Whatever you try and do to God's people, you cannot take away the blessing that God has poured out on them. If God is for us, who can be against us? And because it comes in this kind of narrative where you've got this, com- or this comedy figure who's kind of selling himself for hire, it just makes the point even more forcibly. There's nothing you can do to curse God's people. They are blessed. Uh, numbers is pretty clear. They can bring curses upon themselves. They can do that all right. And by the time you get to Numbers 22, you're in no doubt about that. But other people cannot curse them whenever they like. Um, I minister in East London. We have 65 nationalities in church, many of whom come from Africa. This is a real encouragement to them, I tell you, where family curses and all sorts of things like that just kind of loom large over them. There is a great encouragement to hear that if God is for you, who can be against you? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And here it is, not just stated as a proposition as it is in Romans, but worked out in a real-life example. As um, Balak, the Moabite, looks down on the Israelites marching in a great line and he's petrified by them and then says, I'm going to do whatever I can to stop them. And he can't do anything. That's Numbers 22 um, through to 24. I mean, obviously, there's, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's basically what's going on in those chapters. Right, I'm going to pause and answer questions on Numbers. Um, anything we've been talking about here? Other passages, perhaps, that are perplexing you'd like to have a look at? We've got just over 10 minutes left, so let's use the time well. Anyone here preach numbers? You can now. It's a great book. It's a great book. Would you, do you, would you still advocate going through the whole, um, that, I know you've been saying that, of reading or but you know, doing a series if you're going to have maybe people will break up things, but in the series of perhaps six, seven... Yeah, so in, the, in my commentary, I've got a few suggestions of how you can do it. Um, I mean, so much depends on the church, I think, and what the church is used to and can cope with. Um, both churches where I've preached this could cope with a 16-week series. That just about worked okay. Um, I mean, it was broken up with other things. Um, the, the story does have pace and movement, and um, because most of the stories are unfamiliar, it does grip people. So I think I, w- I, would be, I would be ambitious about going for it. Um, but there are different ways of doing it. Um, so I've, I've done it in India as well, in a week. I did numbers in a week. And we had, um, we were pre- I was preaching in the morning, and I chose six passages. And then we had um, study groups in the evening where they did the bits in between. So that would be another way of doing it, is if you have small groups, for example, you could tie the two together and you could preach a passage and they could do the next section in small groups. So there are different ways of doing it. I think if you... If you're a bit too selective, if you say, here's one rebellion passage, here's one passage of law, here's one passage of grace, I think you lose the weight of it. I think that's the danger. So um, I always remember um, watching Band of Brothers. Have you ever seen Band of Brothers? There's there's an episode of Band of Brothers, which is a World War II drama, where they're in Baston in the um, Ardennes, and and they're being bombed. And they're just in this forest. And the whole episode, essentially, is just these bombs coming down on them. And it's an hour long, and at the end of the hour, you are really weary with it. It, it. It's very cleverly done. It just sort of makes you feel. I mean, they did it. They took it for days, and you've only gone through an hour's bombardment. But you really feel the weight. It's just bombardment after bombardment, and there's a little lull, and you think, oh, at least that's over. And then another bombardment comes. 
And that's basically how the rebellions work in numbers. You get one rebellion, you think, oh, I'm so glad that's over, I'm so glad it's dealt with. And there's another, and then there's another. And actually, the cumulative weight of the different rebellions, one on top of the other, tell us something about the, 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 the nature, the sinful nature that just can drag us down so easily. It's not just a kind of, you know, one moment and it's gone. It's a relentless battle we're fighting, isn't it? Against turning away and, and giving up and hardening our hearts. And I think you would have to find other ways to communicate that. So, of course, you can do it. But you need to find ways to communicate what the book is trying to convey, which is not just, here's a rebellious people. It's, it's rebellion, 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 and constant grace, 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 grace. So I think you'd find, need to find a way to do that. Yes, go on. Two, one, two. Oh, I was just thinking when you looked at Psalm 106, you've got a number of newcomers, or quite a number of people who are not very good at Israel. Psalm 106 maybe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could do that with 1 Corinthians 10 as well, couldn't you? You could use those four instants. Yeah. And of course, all the time you're trying to convey that this is because we're in this sort of now and not yet. That although we're saved and there are great glories of being saved, this is not it. There is something more to look forward to. And, and, and I think increasingly in today's culture, that's a helpful message. Because as, as you know, we, people in many ways get more and more in love with this world. It's, it's, so much, it's so comfortable being a Christian in the West, isn't it, relatively speaking? So comfortable. Um, actually, I think, it, in, I mean, I found when I preached numbers in India, it was much harder to make it resonate when you're preaching it to people for whom, you know, hardships for being a Christian are a daily way of life. They kind of were, they were very eager for the promised land. You know, they were the daughters of Zelophehad trying to hold on to it. Whereas I think people today are not the daughters of Zelophehad. People today are thinking more about the, the moment and not really holding on to the, the prize ahead. Yeah, that's good. That was a good way of thinking. Uh, when you were going to about Balaam, um, I, I thought in a preaching situation, I don't know if you've ever done that or heard of it, but to intersperse preaching with a reading. Yep. So if you've got three chapters to yes. read, yep. um, have you got any experience like that? Does it work? So I am, um, um, you, might, you might not like this, but this is what I did. I, I did what I call a guided reading. Um, so what I did is I read through and I just stopped and made comments as I went. And I didn't dream that up. I learned that from Charles Spurgeon. I never heard Charles Spurgeon. Um, but you know, um, Spurgeon used to comment on the readings as he read. So what we tend to do is, if you read a Spurgeon sermon, you think to yourself, well, that's funny, because he doesn't do that, he doesn't do that, he doesn't really introduce it. All the kinds of things that you would expect you know, a good Bible preacher to do. Um, but very occasionally, people took notes of his readings. And um, what would happen is that he would do all the stuff that we would often put in a sermon stuff like the biblical theology and the context, he would actually do as he went along in the reading. And he would say to people, if you read the transcripts, um, you know, of course, that this passage comes just after, and he would say those things as he was doing the reading, the things that we would put in a, in a sermon. So I, um, with a big passage like Balaam, I did that slightly slower than I did with you, but that kind of thing, I would pause and, and make comments and just draw people's attention, perhaps to the humour which they've missed or the, just how ridiculous it is that, you know, that it's the ass that's saving Balaam, this is... He's a kind of, he's the full guy. So I would, I would make those comments as I went along. I then preached a 15-minute sermon, but the reading had taken 20. So that's the way I did it. That seemed to work okay. There's um, uh, the guy who took over from Spurgeon when um, Spurgeon died. It was called Archibald Brown. He was the first pastor of our church. And um, he was one of Spurgeon's kind of uh, friends. And he used to do the same thing. He used to have these guided readings where he would, he didn't call it guided reading. He would comment on the reading as he went. And there's a great story of... Um, uh, we had a kind of revival um, in the East End of London. Lots of Jewish people were converted. And there's a great story of a man who came along to church because his wife had been converted. And he was convinced that because she'd become a Christian, she wouldn't be a good Jewish wife. She wouldn't cook for him and do all the things he wanted to do. So he came to church with a loaded revolver. And he sat up in the balcony. We had a balcony that went all the way around. And he sat up in the balcony just opposite this kind of raised pulpit. And um, he determined that when um, Archibald Brown climbed into the pulpit stairs and was level with him, he would shoot him for taking his wife away. Well, anyway, um, Archibald Brown used to read from a lower level, then would climb the steps to preach. And he was reading on Isaiah 52, 53, commenting as he went. And this man was converted just during the reading. 
um, as Archibald Brown was speaking. And um, Archibald Brown didn't know anything about it other than when he went into the vestry at the end, the man came into the vestry, put a gun down on the, on the table in front of him, which I'm sure happens in Portsmouth all the time. So he, put the gun down, he put the gun down, it happens in the East End, he put the gun down on, on the table in front of him and he said, I, I came to kill you, but he said, I found my life. And it's a very moving story. And it, it was during the, just the reading of scripture with a few comments that he was converted, not during the preaching. So I, I think it, for long passages it can often be helpful. I think you have to be careful, make sure, you know, this is me speaking now, this isn't... And I think the way to do that is you get people to read it with you, you have it on a screen, or you have people with their Bibles open. There's a, there's a way to do that. But I think it can be helpful for long passages. Thank you. Yes, sir? I mean, it's got a great personal application. And I looked at you, your, your, your brilliant diagram, the, the, the sense that all the, the all the ups and downs, lots of them are uh, pretty now, so it's right down to the bottom, and then there's the turnaround and going up, still with some peaks and drops. Yes. Um, I mean, not the way, you know, I'm not going to speak, but it's, it's, it's the experience of my Christian life. And, uh, you know, the, the, the great part of application is, because it's all orderly, the population of that individual time, Yes. Yeah, to keep going. Thank you. That's very helpful, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think the, the, that, that is true. I think the only, the only caution about that is if you go to chapter 14, we'll just see how serious their grumbling is. Um, and this perhaps is quite helpful on chapter 14. So this is after the spies have come back. They've had a look at the promised land. They've had a little glimpse of the promised land. They've kind of had a taste of what it's like hearing from the spies, but they don't really want to go in. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness... Why is the Lord bringing us to the land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So at this particular point, what are they saying? They are actually saying to God, we wish you hadn't saved us. Now, they're probably, a little bit, um, they're probably being a little bit generous about life in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt, remember. And back in chapter 11, they say, oh, we, I, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt, no cost, no cost. The cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions and garlic. You know, we had this wonderful life in Egypt. <laughs> they didn't have a wonderful life in Egypt. Pharaoh was trying to wipe them out, remember? They, um, you know, the Hebrew midwives saved the day, but Pharaoh was trying to wipe them out. And now they're saying, we wish we were back there. We don't want to go there. And I think if you spiritualise that, that becomes a particular kind of low moment. So I, I take your point about the sort of ups and downs, and I think that's right. But this is almost, this is Hebrews 6, isn't it? This is someone saying, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. This is, in, in Christian terms, this is someone saying, hey, my, my life was much better when I wasn't a Christian, actually. You know, I remember how, I remember how good it was, and I'd like to be back there. Now, Christians do say that from time to time, or they do by the way they live, demonstrate they'd rather be back in the life they were before they were Christians. And so actually the, the word of judgment that comes on the people in chapter 14 is very sobering. It's the same as Hebrews 6. If that's the path you're going to take, be careful what you wish for. Which is basically Hebrews 6, isn't it? You know, the danger of falling away. People who have tasted of certain things and yet still want to give up on it. So yeah, I, I agree. So the roller coaster really does, it, it does resonate with people, doesn't it? That, is, that the Christian life is not just this kind of steady glory. There are battles to be faced, but the prize at the end is, is absolutely glorious and worthwhile. I'm going to pray, and then we're finished. Thank you for having me. I hope that's been helpful. Um, it's a very short introduction to the book of Numbers, but it is a great book. I encourage you to read it, and um, I encourage you to preach it, if that's your job. Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you that it's breathed out by your spirit. Thank you that it's rich and full of Christ Jesus, our saviour. And we do want to see him in all the scriptures. We do want to proclaim him in all the scriptures. Thank you that here in this book of Numbers, even, perhaps even though it seems a little obscure to us, thank you that he is here. Thank you that he is real. Thank you that he was the rock that accompanied these travellers. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that Jesus is the rock that accompanies us. And we pray that whatever our position in church, whatever our responsibility, May we be those who both 
Teach him and proclaim him faithfully to others, but ourselves, we pray, keep our eyes fixed on him. Please, Heavenly Father, may we fix our eyes on Jesus, the Apostle and High Priest, whom we confess. Thank you that he endured the cross for us. He scorned its shame. Thank you, Heavenly Father, he did that for the joy that was set before him. Thank you, you've set joy before us, because we know one day we will see him face to face. Thank you that one day we will inherit that promised land. So, Father, please help us to keep our eyes on that great prize too, we ask, for his name's sake. Amen.